Qué pobres estamos todos, sin un pan para comer, porque nuestro pan lo gasta el patrón en su placer. Mientras él tiene vestidos y palacios y dinero, nosotros andamos desnudos y vivimos en chiquero. Nosotros sembramos todo y todo lo cosechamos, pero toda la cosecha es para el bien de los amos. Nosotros sufrimos todo, la explotación y la guerra, y así nos llaman ladrones porque pedimos la tierra. Y luego los padrecitos nos echan excomuniones, ¿a poco piensan que Cristo era como los patrones? Compañeros del arado, y te doy toda la herramienta, no más nos queda un camino, agarrar un 30-30. Welcome. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That was a Zapatista corrido from the Mexican Revolution called 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 is a rifle. Uh, and uh, this is the dictator game. Um, <clears throat> in the following 12 minutes, uh, if you can stand it, um, <clears throat> will be comprised, as this slide states, of uh, three old fashioned protest songs. Uh, for non-fashionable slogans, for unfashionable games, and a barrage of art questions. <clears throat> um, so in other words, the next 12 minutes uh, will be uh, spent in uh, games that are something in between, uh, en an energy shake of art about something, non-art about that same thing, and something that may be not about something, but that will be about the actual thing. <clears throat> Um, the, uh, the dictator game, in case you are guessing, um, is a, uh, an experimental uh, game invented by experimental economics that uh, tries to prove what is our relationship with money and with income and equality. Uh, for uh, the first game, which is the, the classic dictator game, I would like to ask the collaboration of two volunteers from the audience. Would anybody be interested in? Yes, please, one. Another person? And this, there's money involved in it, by the way. So, you know, so, and I'm not kidding. You know, it's, oh. <laughs> okay. Thank you. And what is your name? Jeff. Jeff, hi Jeff, and? Natalie. Natalie, okay. I'm Pablo, nice to meet you. I'm Pablo, how are you? Do you swear to abide by the rules of the game? Yes. You do, okay, you do? Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, Natalie, um, this is five dollars. They're yours. Nice. You really can take them, okay? Um, the game is that you are a dictator, okay? And you are no one, you're nobody. You have no power whatsoever. You're a dictator and you decide what's gonna happen with those five dollars right now. You can decide as a, as a dictator, uh, as an absolute ruler, whether you keep the five dollars to yourself, whether you decide to give Jeff anything, um, or you give him all the money, or you walk away with everything. What would you like, or would you like to split the money? What would you like to do? As a dictator or as Natalie? <laughs> <laughs> you, Natalie is a dictator right now, so it's, there's no separation of those two ideas. <laughs> Natalie has given uh, Jeff one dollar and she keeps four dollars. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so as, as you can see, um, the dictator game uh, puts you in a difficult situation and with something that we will call peer pressure. You know, Natalie felt perhaps, because she was being watched by all of us, the, the necessity to give something to Jeff. Poor Jeff was nothing, you know. But um, perhaps if she had been alone and found the five dollars, maybe she would not have returned them, but who knows. But we, we never know. But anyway, thank you to you both. Thanks, please, thank you. <clears throat> um, that brings me to the first slogan, which is that which others keep in avarice is for the taking. You know, if you don't feel that really, uh, uh, anyway, if, if somebody has uh, a lot of money and, um, 
and uh, you feel they don't really deserve it, you feel you, you can take it. You know? <clears throat> but I will explain this better with the second uh, game, the second game, Dictator game. For that, I will need uh, two more volunteers. Remember, there's money here, yes. Uh, <clears throat> another one, uh, one more person, yes, thank you. <clears throat> Can you come this, please? Um, your name? Christina. Christina. And Gary. Gary, hi, Gary. Okay, um, Christina. Um, I'm going to give you ten dollars. We're oh, sorry. We're raising the ante here. <laughs> Hold on. Okay, here's okay. This is ten dollars for you, and you're you're gonna actually get five. You know? <clears throat> okay. So um, you are the dictator. Okay. Now you decide whether um, you keep things as they are, keep their $10. You, you can also take his $5, you know, because you're a dictator, you can do anything, it's like, you know, or you can give everything to him, you know, whatever you decide to do. What is, what is it gonna be? How much did she give you? She gave me three. She gave you three. So I have eight very, now, she has seven. Wow, you have seven, you have eight and she, oh, that was very generous of you. Just right for Sunday. <laughs> very good, very good, thank you so much. <clears throat> what, what, the, what the twist of the dictator game shows you is that there's, there's, there's influence in the amount of money that you give to somebody who already has money, you know? So what happened is like, uh, Christina, Christina, right? What she did is like she calculated that he already had $5. So that she didn't really need to give him $5 because he already had $5. You know what I mean? So, it, so he actually, she actually gave, her, gave him less from what she already had because she felt that the added value created income equality. And then there's a, this is a concept of, of, of uh, experimental economics called income inequality. So basically if I, if, if I am in a job and I have a, a coworker and we are doing pretty much the same job and we are kind of at the same level. And then I realize that that person is getting paid more money than me, then I get pissed. Then I want him to get paid less, you know, like me, so that we are at the same level. So what Christina just did was she leveled the field and in a way that actually was a little bit more generous because you ended up keeping less, but in a way you gave him less than what you already had, which is an interesting thing to think about. <clears throat> Um, this also brings me to uh, the, se the second slogan, which is um, tragedy, tragedy gets lost in the specifics, meaning that we, we get very influenced by the situation that is in front of us, that the, 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 the concrete situation <clears throat> that, we, that we encounter um, right in front of us, instead of thinking of world hunger, uh, we are, we're more concerned of the immediate thing that we see, the hunger that happens instead of in front of us. And I will uh, sing now one of the... Um, <clears throat> Uh, mm -hmm. Another uh, another um, uh, Mexican uh, song uh, that that deals with with that subject. <clears throat> it's called El Angelito, the Little Angel, by Oscar Chavez. Ya se murió el angelito y no quisiera llorar. Ya se murió el angelito y no quisiera llorar. Quisiera poder matar al culpable del delito. Quisiera poder matar al culpable del delito. La muerte de este angelito no fue muerte natural. La muerte de este angelito no fue muerte natural. Fue del sistema social que nos mata de a poquito. Fue del sistema social que nos mata de a poquito. Ya se nos fue este angelito, quizá cuantos más irán. Ya se nos fue este angelito, quizá cuantos más irán. A causa del maldito mal, de haber pobres y haber ricos. A causa del maldito mal, de haber pobres y haber ricos. Ya se nos fue este angelito, quizá cuantos más irán. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
third game, the ultimatum game, who would like to play? We, I need two people. <laughs> More money. Yes, please. One more person. You really don't want to earn any money, huh? Okay, yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> um, your name? Vanessa. Vanessa? Georgia. Georgia, um, Georgia congratulations, you're a dictator. <laughs> and I'm sorry, you're not. Uh, <clears throat> um, you have $20 in your hands, okay? But this, things have changed slightly. You know, you have to actually make an offer to the, the non-dictator, uh, and uh, you have to make an offer of an, a certain amount of your money that you have there. If the if offer is satisfactory to you, you might take it, you know, or you might veto the offer, in which case I get the money back, and she gets nothing. What do I get? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> you get the satisfaction of having her, like, not getting anything. Oh. <laughs> um, right. Well, then uh, I will offer you ten. I will take it. <laughs> You'll take it. Very good. Very good. That's another example of income inequality, you know, like the, because you saw the risk of actually losing all the money, you, you decided that the risk of actually splitting the money in an equal way, it actually was beneficial for both of you. So in a way, both of you were winning. If you actually had offered her only one dollar, she, she might not have liked it, in which case you will be left with nothing. Very good, thank you. <clears throat> which brings me to the third slogan, I love you in mutual disgrace, but not in uneven success. And um, the fourth uh, game um, is a competitive ultimatum game. Uh, and for that, I need four um, participants. <clears throat> four participants. Yes. One more? I mean, three more. Two more. Okay. Third. We're still looking for one more. Okay. Good. Okay. Um, let's go. Okay. That's ten for you. <clears throat> that's five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten for you. And ten for you. Looks like you lost here, but you, but, but wait, you know. <clears throat> what happens is that in reality, you are the dictator now, believe it or not. <laughs> but turns out the following, that they are going to offer you, um, oh, hold on a second. Each one of you was going to have to write a number, okay? And each number is going to be an offer of how much money you are offering him, you know? Uh, you are happy to, or you, you are able to choose which is the offer that suits you best, you know? If you don't like any of the offers, then I get all the money back. You know? uh, if you, and if you get, I'm sorry, if you like one of the offers, you pick that offer and then I have to get the money back from the other two. <laughs> so guys, think about your number very well and don't cheat. You can do anything you want. You can offer him the entire $10 if you want, but then you're left with nothing. <clears throat> okay, uh, do you have your number? Okay, so, um, okay, let's, let's, see. let's see what number is here. Five, six, Five. I like six. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. I mean, to get your money back, but <laughs> sorry. Yeah. So well, this we'll, we'll be we'll, we'll use the money toward the reception. You know. <laughs> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> 
<coughs> um, did, you get, did you get your money? Yeah. It's important to get your money. Okay, so um, now I'll, I'll get a little bit more serious now. <coughs> <clears throat> so, uh, hold on to each other as we go down the, prep, the precipice. Um, that's another one of the, of the sayings. And now I'm, I'm going to have my barra barrage of art questions, you know, uh, because this, these, are, these are the questions that I have uh, about art making as I think about issues of equality. <clears throat> Why make art in a world where most people who might need it the most don't have the time to think about art? Why does the real world tend to elude art all the time. Why is it that I feel guilty about making art for art's sake and that I don't want to make art about the thing but that art that it is the thing? And would that be art anymore like this? And does it matter? Why is it that I believe that the phrase everyone is an artist is condescending bullshit? <laughs> Why should art make us equal? Is that art interesting? Is that art even relevant to make? Why is it that declaring that our making is useless is a useless statement? Why do we hide ourselves by constantly asking questions? Why can't we abandon irony? Why do we think that we are better than the others by saying that we are not? Why do we condemn idealism but have nothing to offer in return? Who will save me from pontificating, becoming didactic and paralyzed from fear of being mediocre and the fear from your judgment of me? What is the game that we're playing now? Where do others fit? Where is our altruism? Who's gaining what? Who is losing? What do we want from art? What do I want from the public? What does the public want from me? And why should I give it? Are we looking for victims to save? Would that save us instead? Are we looking to be heroes? Are we looking to be famous, admired, classy? Proletarian, sexy, above the fray, larger than life, legendary, historical, radical, special, unique, generous, beautiful. Is this a pointless list of questions? <clears throat> and I will now sing the last song <clears throat> by Woody Woodry. <clears throat> uh, called the Portee. Uh, the song is um, a, um, was written um, in the 1940s by, perhaps you would know him, very famous uh, folk singer, uh, American folk singer, uh, in the 1940s after an incident in which the, in the U.S.-Mexican border, uh, a plane that was carrying uh, 28 uh, Mexican migrant farm workers uh, that were, had just been working on the fields uh, crashed in, in a canyon. Uh, the newspaper referred to these people as non-entities, as just deportees, not as people. And that's when, when uh, Woody Guthrie uh, saw that ad or that uh, announcement in the newspaper, he wrote this song, Deportee. <clears throat> the crops are rallying and the peaches are rotting. The oranges are piling, the creoles all tea down. They're flying them back to the Mexican border to pay all the money to way the back again. Goodbye to my Juan, goodbye Rosalita. Adios mis amigos Jesus y Maria. You won't have your name when you ride a bigger plane. And all that will call you will be the party. My father's and father, he waited that river. They took all the money he made in his life. My brothers and sisters come working the fruit trees, and they rode the truck till they took down and died. We died in your hills and we died in your deserts. We died in your valleys and died on your plains. We died near your trees and we died in your bushes. Both sides of the river we died just the same. The sky plane caught fire over Las Gatos Canyon. A fireball of lightning and shook all our hills. Who are all these friends all scattered like dry leaves? 
The radio says they are just the portees. Is this the best way we can grow the orchards? Is this the best way we can grow our good fruit? To fall like dry leaves, to rot on my topsoil, and be called by no name except the Portee. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, we needed to do a little of character change there, you know, so that the feel was different, you know? Um, I um, thank you so much and for uh, letting me sub subject you to uh, this performance that uh, it's actually the first time I do it. Uh, and uh, it's part of a, uh, uh, a presentation that I will be doing. It's maybe a, a, an excerpt of a, a presentation that we'll be doing in New York next month on the subject of inequality. And, uh, and I'll explain maybe some, some of the stuff that, that, that I said in that, uh, that original presentation may, may make more sense as I go along describing my, the work that I'm, that I'm working on, that I have worked in the past. Um, you, the way I usually do this, I, I, I present a number of projects. Um, uh, the projects that I do are, are very um, extensive in, uh, in research and, 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 and details, so it's difficult for me to actually do, to talk a lot of a lot of projects, because that takes a long time. Um, so I will, being respectful of your time, I will uh, keep myself to less, to less projects and uh, try to dwell a little bit more on them. The, um, the, the work that I do uh, is what, uh, it really varies in, 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 many, in, in terms of mediums and, and, uh, and approaches. Uh, I have been uh, associated with uh, engage, socially engaged art, with uh, or what some people call social practice. I was trained uh, as a painter originally, but I also, I also was interested in music. And uh, when I discovered performance, performance art, I, I embraced it fully. And, and then I, uh, as I was working in museum education, I realized that that would help me to to work with audiences better. Uh, so those are those are the the general interests that that, are, that appear in my work. I am very interested in. I was telling to to somebody uh, this later today. I basically, what I'm interested in is in people and what people have to say and the, peop the the narratives that people contain, either whether they're alive people or people who existed in the past or etc. Um, so in, in my in my projects, I try to, to find those narratives contained in the, in, the, in the participant. And one of the examples is the project, the Club de Protesta, which uh, was exploring the history of the protest song and protest music. Um, the, the project started, uh, this was before Occupy Wall Street in, in New York, uh, where I felt that um, th there was a, an important moment for, to find the soundtrack of the, the time we're living in. Uh, every time there's a, uh, an important historical event, you might realize that there's always uh, music connected to it. There's always a song that defines an era, the song that, uh, and, and especially, especially in political times, you know? And the, 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 the protest song uh, fulfills that function in the, in the sense that it, it's a song that, that, that becomes embraced by a whole generation of people and that uh, normally has an, an element of uh, folklore in it, meaning that it's easy to sing, uh, that it's, it's, it's accessible, and usually people take uh, tunes from, that are very familiar to, to create those music. Um, so what, the, what, what I did with the, with the project, I worked with, with low-income residents in a, in, a, in a building in New York City um, who had no music experience to write the songs that they felt they needed to express to the public. Uh, and uh, making them work with professional musicians to, to put those songs into, on stage. So this, was a, this is a very difficult proposition because on the one hand you, you, don't want, you want to do something that's signified and you want to put somebody who has no experience you know, on a stage doing something that, that might not make them look good. You know? But the fact of the matter is that they, had all, they carried all the content, they knew what they wanted to talk about. And, and we, that our challenge was to facilitate that possibility. You know, <clears throat> so in a way, he, he, to me, that this project, this kind of projects, represent uh, the relationship that an artist can have with the public. Uh, in other words, becoming like a platform in which you can create a structure in which a participant can 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 bring their 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 knowledge uh, in a in a leveled environment. So it, the, the, so the piece is really not about <clears throat> it's really not about art for art's sake, but it's really it, it's really about art dialoguing 
with the, with the interests and needs of of, of 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 the public, you know, whichever the public may be. Um, just to give you um, an example of of how I usually work in these kind of projects, and and you know, um, socially engaged art is a is a complicated term that. Um, um, that sometimes people define as community art, public art, uh, participatory art, relational aesthetics. I mean, there's so many different names for that. Uh, I think each one of these terms refer to different periods of time and, and of different kinds of art making. Um, and uh, I, I kind of feel that the term social engaged art is more specific than that. Um, but anyway, I, um, this, this project that Lisa mentioned, uh, I, I did it last year in Bologna and in Italy. And um, the project was called Aelia Media. And I will pretty much I'll more or less describe what, what the scenario of the project was. Uh, the project took place in, uh, in the city of Bologna, which is the capital of the, Re Re uh, um, the, the Emilia Romagna region of Italy. It's the north of Italy. Uh, it's very progressive and actually the, maybe the most pro uh, socialist uh, uh, communist part of Italy, or used to have that, that, uh, that history. Uh, they had a very functional communist party that actually uh, worked until pretty well into uh, the 20th century, and uh, and uh, the left is, is maybe the strong, the strongest in Italy. Um, has a strong uh, history of, of community organizations and uh, and uh, <clears throat> and, and societies of mutual support. Uh, it also has an interesting history of, of a student movement that took place in in Bologna in 1977, which was the uh, response to the 68 and uh, and the 77 movement in Bologna. Uh, defined a whole generation. Uh, there were students that were actually playing more with irony and, and they were trying to, to critique the, the, the stiffness that they felt the, the previous generation had already acquired in, in their ideological sense. Uh, and, what they, and their medium was radio, it was pirate radio. So uh, in, in Italy it was possible and it still is possible to steal radio waves and then create a little station that would be kind of like a community station. Um, and, uh, they, these uh, students became known as Indiani Metropolitani, like Metropolitan Indians. Uh, they will occupy spaces, they will, they, will, they will steal radio waves, and they will like, take, take out their, their, uh, <coughs> their, uh, their ideas through that. Uh, Bologna has changed a lot since then. Um, it, um, uh, it eventually, uh, under the Berlusconi uh, regime in, uh, in Italy, which was very much uh, of the right, uh, lost, uh, the left lost a lot of the power, the church gained a lot of power and put like, uh, for example, religious statues in the, pia in the piazzas, kind of like a statement of like, this is what dominates the, the city now. You know? um, and uh, so there's, there's a, there was a contentious thing with the, with the, with the space in the, in, in the city. Uh, so what my thoughts about toward the project were, were to really um, try to activate again the, the public space uh, with the public and um, thinking about two uh, particular uh, ways of thinking uh, on the subject. Uh, Jack Ancia saying, you know, the public, should, the, the public becoming uh, a, a, an emancipated public is a public of, of narrators and storytellers. And Jello Biafra, an activist, saying, don't hate the media, become the media. So the, the, the proposal was to create a, a radio station. Um, a radio, it was really like a radio school uh, for, for art producers. Uh, that, will be, that will be presented in, the piazza, in, a, in a piazza in, in Italy in a as a transparent kiosk from which we will do uh, public broadcasts. Um, we worked with uh, local architects, uh, like a young group of local architects, to build this so, uh, eco-sustainable structure that was also transparent. Uh, and we spent the whole summer working with the, the local artists. And you know, the, the art scene in Bologna was very, very depressed. It's very depressed still. There's no art galleries left. There's no art spaces left. They, they, it's, it's kind of like a very difficult situation for artists who are starting, uh, even though Bologna is a university city that is actually the oldest university in the world, you know, founded in the 10th century. Um, they, don't have, like, they don't have avenues where to show their work. Uh, so what, what, the, uh, what we tried to convince them was that uh, the best thing we could do in a project like this would be to give them the tools to open space, for themselves to open themselves a space to do more things. And the tools were to actually learn how to, to produce sound, to produce radio, so they actually 
in, in a city like Italy, uh, physical space is very hard to come by. Everybody lives with their parents. You know, it's kind of terrible. You know? <laughs> and, and I'm a parent, you know, by the way. So, uh, <laughs> um, no, but the thing is that uh, uh, what I was trying to show them was that you can actually uh, create space in, in, the, in the airwaves. You know, and you can, uh, there's time to space. You know, and, uh, and I very firmly believe that the time is today's real state. You know, it's a 21st century real state. Um, so uh, it was kind of like a, like a way of, of rethinking, uh, uh, convince them to, to rethink the, their practice in ways that they could actually take different forms. You know? um, and, um, and, so, and so on, we, we, uh, we started the project. And um, what was interesting was that the project also coincided with the, the dramatic uh, political changes that Italy uh, underwent last fall. And, and most of Europe, uh, you might remember that, that uh, <clears throat> if you follow up with politics, you know, Silvio, Silvio Berlusconi, after 20 something years or 30 years of being um, in ruling Italy, he, he fell in the end, you know? And uh, we started broadcasting on the day in which the, the protests uh, that ultimately brought him down um, uh, came to Italy on October 20th. Uh, so it was kind of like a very interesting moment. And uh, what was also very interesting was that we were able to establish a dialogue with the um, with the, the leaders of the 77 movement, you know, and um, uh, Franco Berardi, who is in the image, he's, he's a very famous activist that uh, he's known as Bifo as well. He's a, he's a very important uh, thinker and, um, and left-wing uh, uh, provocateur, you know, that, in, the, in the region of Italy. Uh, the, and to me, what, what was really important in the, in the project was that eventually there was a moment in which as an artist, you know, you basically, I'm, I'm not Italian, I don't live in Bologna, I, I, eventually I have to leave, you know, unless I decide to move in forever, but that's not my, my fate, you know, the destiny, I guess. Um, the project became very much owned by the community, you know, and to me that's ultimately the important aspect of, uh, of approaches like these. So, so the students of the university started like doing their own happenings and performances in the space, uh, and uh, and this, the, the, the artists that I've worked with, they, they, they were left with equipment and continued uh, pursuing the, the project of, of doing radio um, programs. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so that's one, one of the examples of a, what the, the kind of projects that I do. You know, and, and, and they really range from in, in quality and, and, uh, and, and, and uh, success. You know, as, as, as this is kind of, a, uh, let's be honest, you know, they, this, are, this is a very difficult thing to do. You, know, you never know exactly what are the conditions and how the conditions are going to respond to what you try to do. You know? Um, and, but also there's different scales to this, uh, to this kind of work. Um, one of, uh, like an early piece that I did maybe more than 10 years ago uh, along these lines was very simple. It was simply me, it was called The Singing Telegram Show. Uh, I, sang, I, I dressed like as an old telegram uh, uh, deliverer, I guess. And I was singing uh, telegrams uh, all over. With, with, I had all these phone cards, you know. Uh, and then I was with a phone outside of a bar in a little town that was doing a little festival. And basically, I would, I would sing messages to whoever asked me for free, you know. So I had a kind of repertoire of all the songs I knew. And uh, people had, uh, would comment and give me a message that I would just simply call somebody to actually deliver, you know. Um, and and what, what happened was really interesting. We were going to do it for one hour. I ended up being there for nine hours, you know. Uh, there was a line of people all day, you know. And, um, and uh, it, it was a little town. In the end, like, the entire town was there, you know. Uh, and they were actually sending messages to each other, you know, <laughs> like <laughs> and, um, sometimes saying like, oh, tell so-and-so that I'll be there in five minutes, you know, and I will do that. And or sometimes they will say things like, tell him that the bear, blah, 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 like in code, and then I had no idea what I was saying. I would tell it to the other person, the other person would laugh, ha, 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 and I was like completely in the dark as to what I had said, you know. But that was okay, because I was really just a messenger. And again, it was like another example of how I see that, you know, as an artist, one can play that role of like bringing people together, you know, uh, in, in kind of like this, sometimes can be humorous or strange or, or funny way. Um, but ultimately, it was really about per personal communication, you know. And, um, <clears throat> and simply, it's just, it, I guess my point is really that, you know, it's not that you really need to do like a huge project in a, you know, like spending like a, a fortune to, to make that happen. You can, it, it, human communication is so simple and so direct. And that's what, that's also I think uh, very interesting about it. Yeah? <clears throat> uh, another example of this uh, kind of work um, was a, uh, a project that I did uh, in 2008 with uh, uh, a couple of curator friends of mine who opened a little tiny space in Chicago. I'm sorry, in New York, in Chinatown. 
Um, it's in uh, if you if you have ever been to Chinatown, you may know it's it's very tight there. You know, there's there's a lot of stuff happening in there. There's a lot of little stores next to each other. It's a very densely populated uh, part of the city. And um, and one thing that, that you might encounter if you are there, uh, there are like these little uh, card reading parlors. You know, I'm, I'm sure there's a number here too as well. Um, you know, the person that's sitting in a in little window with like the, the crystal ball and the, in the tarot, and then they charge you, and they'll tell you your future and blah blah. So I thought that it, the, the, my my friend's space was so tiny; it was practically a closet. You know, I thought you know the really like the only thing I can fit is myself and maybe another person. You know, <clears throat> and I thought, well, why don't, why don't we do like a little card reading parlor? And I, I put a very cheap price, you know, one dollar, like defeated everybody in my competition. You know, I felt bad later, but whatever. Um, <clears throat> um, and uh, what I did is I created my own tarot uh, deck. You know, it was called the Seven Bridges of Konigsberg. And I was sitting there uh, uh, for, uh, I don't know, let's say four weeks during the, the duration of the show, having people coming uh, from all walks of life to talk to me. Even though we would tell people that this was an art project, in a way that didn't matter at all. And again, people forgot, for, will forget immediately about that, whether this was an art project or not. They would immediately start asking questions about the future, and uh, each one of the cards uh, represented uh, different things. Um, and the way that I that I um, <clears throat> would, would do this is like it, it's using basically a very simple principle that, that has to do with art education. Uh, I mean, I well, my job. Um, I, I've worked in museums for many years, uh, where you <clears throat> you basically uh, your my job is to make to make people make meaning out of the art that they see in the gallery, you know. And um, it is very different when you see when when I tell you something like oh, here's a plastic watch to say this is the watch of Barack Obama, you know, or then, then you really want to see it, you know, like you want to see what's 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 Obama-esque about the watch, you know, <clears throat> for example. So um, in the same thing, it's, it, it happens when I show you an image and I say, well, here's an image of two weird faces, um, or if I say this image represents your childhood, you know. So so immediately you start making all sorts of associations. Well, why there's no nose in the image, and why there's a two people? Like so, then, then, then your 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 brain triggers tons of different connections. So what would happen in these readings would be very much like I would I would start showing this image and saying like this is the image that corresponds to your chapel, this is the image that represents what's in front of you, what's behind you. If you have done the tarot you may get the sense of what how the, 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 the reading goes. But I mean it, I mean card readings generally are meant to provoke meaning. You know it's I mean I I, I personally don't believe in this uh, esoteric in all of the esoteric ideas. But um, but I, I the person will tell me everything. And what was interesting also about the process was that they, they had thought that I had discovered it, you know. That the, what, when they had not realized is that they had discovered themselves. And what was interesting of, of the project was that the, the people who participated in it, um, uh, actually the, the art people were the hardest to talk to because they did not, they felt so so self-conscious about it. You know? But other people would come and look, confess me incredible things, you know, that they were gay, secretly gay, that that they wanted to. Uh, that they were soldiers, but they were wanting to move to Paris and be a singer, and, and, and somebody who was obsessed with their neighbors and like would talk to me every single day, come to come to meet me every day, you know, to talk about their neighbors <coughs> and know more about the neighbors, and they would, she could never get enough. Um, so you create these very interesting personal situations. You know. But you know, as I, I mentioned, museums, and uh, I'll just quickly mention a few projects that that are slightly uh, different in nature. Uh, the more exhibition oriented, but uh, so just to tell you like, about some of the topics that interest me. Um, one of the things that interests me about museums is these paradoxes of preservation uh, that museums have. In other words, museums um, preserve things supposedly forever for future generations, but the act of preservation in a way, in a way kind of kills it, you know, because the thing is not anymore what it was. You know? um, and um, one of the things that I wanted to, to, to do with thinking about this was uh, dealing with the, the topic of dead languages, which I'm very personally interested in. Uh, some of you might know, if you are interested in dead languages like me, is that every two weeks or so, the last speaker of a language dies. And within our lifetimes, uh, around half of the world's languages will be gone forever. <clears throat> this is part of the process that, of, that has been going on for many years, many centuries. Uh, but now, basically, the, the, the pace of which, again, languages die is very different of the pace with which they are created. But practically, there are no languages created in the way that they were before. <clears throat> so what I thought would be uh, interesting to do, to, to, 
draw attention to this phenomenon was not to use the latest technology, but to use the oldest technology, a technology that was also extinct, practically, which is a phonograph. Uh, I worked with a man uh, named uh, Sean Bory, who uh, is one of the last persons that actually makes phonograph cylinders. These are the objects that Thomas Alva Edison invented in, in the, the 1850s uh, to, to, to do the first recordings. Um, the objects look like these um, uh, small um, cylinders, you know, uh, kind of like a, almost like a, a roll of toilet paper, you know, like a tiny roll of toilet paper. And if you see them uh, closely, you'll see that these grooves are marked in it. Um, they're the, the group, same groups that you will see in an LP. Uh, what ha the, 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 the process is that like a, a diamond needle records the vibrations of the sound and then uh, carves them in little hills inside this, this object. So it creates this like, very beautiful kind of uh, uh, very touchable object. And, and to me, it was like a, like a very, very concrete manifestation of this disappearing voice, you know? <clears throat> uh, that in a way that, that digital technology is very hard to comprehend, like where does that really reside? You know, where does that particular phrase reside, you know, for example. Um, and what I did is uh, I, I went around Mexico, which turns out to be the third richest country in the world of, of disappearing languages, uh, along with India and China. Uh, and especially northern Mexico has a lot of last speakers. Uh, so I, I was in Sonora and Baja California. Uh, this woman is Cunyay. She's a speaker of a language that, uh, that is practically completely gone. <clears throat> and this woman is Cucapá. The Cucapá are from Sonora and they had this incredible uh, literature of, um, of songs and poetry and, and uh, myths of origin. And there's only maybe like maybe four people left that speak the language. And, um, and I always tell people, you know, to just imagine, you know, what, what would we feel like, you know, that, that you were maybe the last speaker of the English language, that you would be the last person that could possibly understand a song by Shakespeare or a, or a song by the Beatles or, or anything like that, you know, and um, anything that, that defines our culture, you know, and uh, our English-speaking culture. Uh, and as you also may know, I mean, the, the, the ultimate uh, threshold of a culture is language. Like, if you don't speak the language, there's simply no way you, how you can penetrate uh, at the deeper level of that of that culture? You know, there's simply no way. I mean, you can you can you can get a little sense of what's going on, but you know, if you have to learn the language. You know, <clears throat> so um, I don't know. Like, I, I'm 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 very interested in that in those ideas of like uh, of disappearance of, of the uh, of, but of also of the locality of culture. You know, and this this might this might be a good segue for the the Pan American project. Um, <clears throat> Um, well, at first I will talk about one more uh, project that, that was kind of uh, connected as well. So, I mean, uh, the locality of culture, I, I was interested in how, yeah, in, in the world that we live in that's, that's very globalized, you know, like we, we tend to feel that, that um, <clears throat> um, um, th it's, it's hard to, to, to understand how he hegemonic forces operate, you know. Uh, for example, we think that American culture is everywhere. But that's not really exactly true. In the same way that it's not true that all the internet is all over the world, you know. And I wanted to draw attention to a, to a, to a, fact, to a historical fact that uh, I learned about when I was visiting Eastern Europe. Uh, and I realized that everyone in uh, Eastern Europe was really into Mexican soap operas, you know. Uh, <clears throat> um, so um, I invented a, uh, a, a research institute called the, the Institute, Instituto de la Investigación de la Telenovela, the Soap Opera Institute. There was essentially a, um, a research center that traveled throughout Eastern Europe, you know. And, um, just to give you a sense of like the, the magnitude of the influence of, of soaps in Eastern Europe, um, in 1992, uh, Commonwealth Channel Ostankino, which is, uh, was at that time the biggest uh, channel in Russia, uh, started broadcast. Uh, that was after the fall of the wall, after the fall of communism. Um, there was no state television anymore. There was nothing to watch on TV. People were de really bored. You know? And um, <clears throat> so the Russian channel uh, bought the rights to Los Ricos Tamin Llora. It's like a Mexican soap opera from the 70s, really bad. And, and really uh, cheesy, um, even for uh, Mexican standards. <laughs> and, uh, and, um, uh, but it was very popular, and uh, it was very cheap for the Russians to, to basically buy the rights for that, and, and they started broadcasting it. Well, the, the impact was immediate. Um, the, the story of Los Ricos Samillones is a typical Mexican soap uh, story. Basically, the main uh, 
who is actually a very beautiful woman, you know, um, uh, falls in love with the son of the of the owner of the house, you know, who is also very beautiful. And, but he's of course rich, she's poor, and she's kind of indigenous, and he's white. And so there's like all these racial and social class undertones that go on there. And then of course, you know, ultimately after 250 episodes, you know, they come together. <coughs> uh, in the meantime, <laughs> you are there sitting for three months, and what's going to happen? You know? What's going to happen? Uh, <laughs> and, <laughs> And um, <clears throat> um, but but this what was interesting was that the, in, in Eastern Europe where the where there were a lot of unresolved issues about social class you know and race that that communism had completely kind of like lost over and and it provoked this cathartic reaction to millions of people um, the 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 movie oh sorry the, the soap opera and the last uh, 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 tra transmission of the the last episode of the Costa Miguel broke the record of the history of television uh, because the entire so the ex Soviet Union watched it. You know, uh, up to this day, there's a lot of people who, who, who have kids who, with names of Mexican uh, characters of soap operas. Boris Yeltsin received uh, Veronica Castro at the Kremlin and so forth. You know. um, and so what was really interesting to me was that the, um, <clears throat> the project, um, uh, it was really kind of like a media literacy project, but also an exhibition. And, uh, and I created this very um, Mexican modernist space for the, um, for the people that, that were coming in. And, and if you have been to Eastern Europe and maybe places like uh, Ljubljana in Slovenia or Zagreb or Poland, I mean, the, generally the, the colors of the houses tend to be pretty dark, you know, like ochres and grays. And so when people will walk into these places, they will be completely like shocked, you know, that, that there was such a color in the walls. <clears throat> Um, this, is a, this was a, a presentation in the Zagreb uh, the Art Museum, um, and it was called Telenovela Bar. I, the, the show was, I made a show in the bar, it was a tequila bar, <coughs> uh, where the exhibition was at tables. Uh, and what was really interesting about it was like the, we did workshops where uh, uh, women that uh, in their 40s, they were uh, homemakers, and etc., they, they would come to participate in this workshop to talk about soaps. The first time that, that these kind of people came ever to the Museum of Contemporary Art. And like, it, was, it was a moment where we displaced the contemporary art crowd, you know, where like, the, like all the black uh, dressed uh, cool artists walked in and we were completely like, <laughs> thrown away, you know, by like, like this, this discussion and because they knew so much about the soaps and there was so much to talk about, you know. <clears throat> So anyway, the, the, the project, um, so what, this, is, this brings me back to what I was talking about, how, I, how I'm very interested in how the, the, the participant brings the content, you know, how, how there's a, uh, there's a, there has to be a dialogue, you know, in which the, there, this, the, there's the, the participant claims a certain kind of ownership and where they feel that they really belong there. You know, to me that's a very important aspect of what I do. But at the same time, I, I, I want to create spaces that, that are not simply about comfort, that are simply about being, feeling, uh, fine, but also about um, feeling challenged, you know, uh, because I feel that art that, that does not provide a, a degree of challenge, um, <clears throat> um, it's, um, it's problematic, you know, it, it's, uh, you're not, you're, you're not, you're not, uh, you're not uh, inviting people to think critically about what they're doing, you know, or what they're living. <clears throat> And I'm going to talk about a, a project that, in a way, summarizes all these things that I've, I've thought about in, in, over the years. And um, this uh, project uh, started uh, actually after 9-11. I was in New York in the, after 9-11. And um, the impact of the events that happened then, and like the subsequent invasion of Iraq, et cetera, uh, made me first very numb uh, in terms of like my relationship with art. I felt like, you know, what, what is, what's the point of making art today? You know, why, 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 why uh, me as an artist, what can I do to, to contribute to the world, you know, and what is really the role of, in, in the art when, of art when, when, when things as, as, as important are, hap are happening right now. Um, I felt it was important to study, or at least I wanted to understand why the United States became the, the hegemonic power, you know, that it became when in reality in the 19th century, like all the countries that were created here in this part of the continent had a great degree of hope of, of like be, being these free societies, you know, uh, <clears throat> what had gone wrong. And this applied also to Latin America, you know, but this was a conversation that I didn't see really happening uh, in a, in a bi, in a, in a bi, in a, in a bi continental, like a mini Anglo America, Latin America type of way. Um, and I wanted to, to, as an artist, establish a series of dialogues about what 
the idea of uh, Pan Americanism meant today, the, the idea of, 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 of uh, regional collaboration and, uh, and really what, what that really all meant. I wanted to do it as a, as a platform, as an educational platform. <coughs> and um, um, the, the project became called the School of Pan American Unrest. Uh, it, it was a school uh, structure uh, that I first attempted it in, in, in Zurich, uh, of all places, because they gave me the, the resources to do it. Um, and um, it, was a, it was an exhibition about war and peace. And then uh, I, did, I conducted workshops inside the schoolhouse. And then I realized that I just really needed to basically go through the Americas to, to do these workshops. And I also felt very strongly that I needed to bring the schoolhouse with me. I had no idea how the hell I was going to do that, but I said, that has to happen, you know? <clears throat> uh, and I also, of course, uh, well, it, for, to me, the logical thing, as well as the only, the only way to do it was to actually drive, you know? And uh, so uh, the project would be to drive from Anchorage to Ushuaia, which is like the, the tip of the continent, um, doing a number of stops in between. Easier said than done. <clears throat> but um, with some funding, I was able to, to create this, uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, collapsible schoolhouse, which actually would fit into a van that, uh, that I bought in Alaska, and then off I went, doing my workshops that actually would be meet with different people along the way. <clears throat> the, 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 the structure of the, of the, of the which one of my interactions was pretty simple. I mean, I would, I would try to find a host that would uh, uh, for, with which we will do a, an event that will be kind of like a panel discussion about topics that interested the, the local audience. Uh, we would do a, pa uh, a workshop on, on, the, on, the, on those topics the day after. And then we would do, <coughs> uh, this will be a panel, uh, the, the, the schoolhouse will be operating as a cultural center. Uh, we're showing films of the Americas, et cetera, uh, where people could like uh, be inside. And to me it was very important to have that autonomous space, you know, that it was really not about me and the visual just arriving, but it was like this whole space in which these things could happen. That would have a certain independence from whichever place was hosting me. <coughs> the, the event, uh, well the trip also included interviews with uh, last speakers. And I was very lucky that my very first encounter was with the last speaker of IAC in Anchorage. Uh, her name is Mary, was Mary Smith Jones. She passed away in 2008. Uh, she was the the was the was a Tabascan language, <coughs> and she was uh, the last one of the line. <coughs> it's a very moving encounter. Um, and um, <coughs> the uh, the project um, had a, had an element of romanticism in it. You know? uh, <coughs> of course, I mean there was no way you could not embrace it, uh, given that you know the Americas are so connected to the ideas of the missionaries traveling. Uh, uh, to explorers, to the big poets, uh, taking, taking on the getting on the road uh, of the Baron, hum, Baron Humboldt, you know, going through South America and so on and so forth, <coughs> and and, uh, and 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 quite honestly, the American landscape is extraordinary. I mean, the the um, going going down the, the Alaskan Highway into Vancouver was uh, an unforgettable experience for me, <coughs> and. Um, and it was really encountering like the vastness of the, of, of the American landscape in the continental sense of the world. Uh, in Vancouver, um, <coughs> uh, we, it was a very important stuff for the, for the project because we, that's where we wrote the first Pan American address. Uh, in this case, the Pan American address of the people of Vancouver. It, it, was, it was decided at that moment that it was really important for the group to, to make a statement about what was going on. That it was important for the, the, the group collectively to express a statement uh, a proactive statement of purpose about what they want, how they saw the situation in Vancouver, and, and how, what would they, what would they do about it? In the particular case of Vancouver, it was very interesting. It was a moment where the city was preparing for the Olympics, and um, <coughs> this was in 2006, uh, and um, and it was uh, the the city was becoming uh, very renovated, but the, the the process of gentrification was pushing away all the art spaces, and in fact, the art space where we did uh, this presentation eventually disappeared, the Helen Pitt Gallery. Um, <coughs> and uh, and uh, it was, I think it's one of the most beautiful um, addresses that was written uh, where um, it basically talked about you know, the, the way that art, what artists needed to do to preserve the, the, the culture of Vancouver. Yeah. <coughs> um, the, 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 each one of the performances would include the reading of the, of the address and then like the singing of, a, of the Pan American anthem that I had composed. It was like a fictional anthem, of course. But uh, it, the the whole um, the whole event had these accrual moments of the of the of the civic encounter, you know, 
And uh, it was important for me to enact all those civic uh, uh, actions, you know, to, to make the project really uh, embrace this idea of Pan America, you know, <coughs> the, the band, of course. Um, and I mean, yeah, I mean, this, this, this is a project that is so extensive. I mean, the, the project lasted four months. I, I couldn't possibly tell you everything that happened along the way. Um, but um, but I, I can just briefly tell you that the, the project evolved in such a way that, especially after it crossed the American border, uh, the, 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 the project ceased to really be uh, primarily in our project. Uh, not because of my intentions of any kind, but, the, but slowly the project because it was because the, the host institutions started varying, in the, not, not just museums, but they were like social organizations, uh, universities, and uh, the topics that we were discussing. <clears throat> I mean, this, there still was an element of performance and, and art in it, you know, uh, and it was very ambiguous for everybody all the time, you know. But we will encounter situations where like the, the the mayor of the town will come meet me as well as the artists, you know, like the like dignitaries will come. And they sit on the same event, which we didn't know if it was a civic event or a performance. It was both of them. We, neither. We didn't know. I still don't know. You know? <clears throat> but uh, but that was kind of like the ambiguity that I, I of course like very much enjoy. You know about these crazy things. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the other thing that Central America was very meaningful because for Central American countries, the idea of the of the the, the larger American continent is very important. The, the idea of integration, of regional integration, is absolutely key. When you're a big country like Canada, you know, perhaps that might not be such a present thing, but when you're a tiny country like El Salvador, that's absolutely key, you know. Uh, you have to really see yourself as part of a larger whole. And, um, and, uh, and of course, the, the other thing is that in, in, in countries like Guatemala or, or Honduras, I mean, there's, there's a very serious uh, history of civil unrest, of, of civil wars, of, uh, of, of, of gang problems, of drug trade. I mean, like the, the borders were incredibly difficult uh, for me to cross, um, not, just, not just because of the bureaucratic nightmares that it encompassed, but of the corruption and other things that I had to, to deal with, you know. And I mean, it was really going through the, the physical border of countries is very illuminating for anybody. And I would recommend it to anybody to do because we are so familiar or we're so unfamiliar with how the physical territory, even of our own countries, looks like, you know. Uh, for me, it was incredible to see the Mexican border with Guatemala. You know, it just one thing. You know, <clears throat> and um, and and also, I mean, the, the 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 other thing that was for me a great test was the uh, the man that he placed for me as a physical as a person, psychologically and and, and physically, uh, psychologically in the sense that the way pr people projected images onto me, like uh, expecting me to be a, a politician, a missionary, a uh, problem solver, uh, a therapist. Uh, a, a variety of things, you know, um, <clears throat> and of course physically, you know, because of the of the whole uh, transition. But but the, the the energy that created by the different communities of artists that were that I was meeting along the way uh, was very revealing. Um, and um, they, soon I felt that the project really very soon stopped being really. I mean, I, I was I was a carrier of the project, but. In a way, I had no choice as to really that direction of the project. People were in, it were really taking over it, you know, as as we as we went along, as I went along. I, I drove mainly alone, you know, with some volunteers here and there, but no one would dare really do more than just a little bit of driving, you know, with me. Um, <clears throat> things kind of like came to a head in Colombia, where uh, a lot of things happened to me. They stole my laptop. Uh, my my car crashed against the bus. You know, uh, in a little town, I must go to jail, and I lost all my money. <laughs> I mean, so I was, I was in a moment where, which, ironically, uh, it was kind of like the most, uh, one of the most uh, uh, complicated, uh, well, difficult moments of my life because I was, I was in, in, the, in a foreign country with no money and like almost like being prosecuted by the police. You know, uh, and um, and uh, ironically, I was left with the, the, the rest of the money that I had left in a little, very dubious repu repute uh, hotel. Um, in, in the border of Venezuela and Colombia, and I was and, and against my window. There was a building that was in ruins as well. Turns out that was the building where, where Simon Bolivar declared La Gran Colombia, where he declared he declared the constitution of the integration of the of the of the South American countries, which of course was a failed project. You know? uh, it so happened though that uh, a friend in, or somebody who was in Venezuela. Uh, uh, acted and uh, sent me some money <laughs> and then allowed me to continue with the project, which was uh, what saved the entire thing, you know. 
<clears throat> um, but as I said, you know, it was the, the South American portion of the project became very, very moving in the sense that um, um, it, it really became a truly communitarian effort. I did not have the resources of, of the North American institutions that it was much easier to get a university support in a place like this. I like, I, I, like a place like Canada or the US or even Mexico. Uh, in, in Paraguay, you know, it was really, I, my, my schoolhouse was stuck in customs, so the community built it, you know, built a new one. And, uh, and we were, ne we built it in the palace of, in front of the Plaza of Congreso, which is the, the Congress, uh, the old Congress Plaza, that is next to a shantytown. Uh, and the children of the shantytown were so excited, they, they, they said that finally they were going to go to school. <clears throat> so we did, we did activities with the children. Uh, of the of the of, of Paraguay, I was also told at the time that I was the first artist in ten years who came from outside to to visit Paraguay, you know, and which also made me think about how 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 interesting is it that we are obsessed, you know, as, as artists to to always exhibit in the same three places, you know, like always like this and that and that, where actually there's millions of people doing that the same thing, which cancels each other, while you you can go to another country that can benefit enormously from what you do, and can be enormously appreciative of what you do. You know, and, and yet we insist on always being exactly in the same spot altogether. You know, <clears throat> it's very incongruous. You know? uh, and so, not to make the, the long story short, um, <clears throat> the the I did reach the the end of the world. This is literally known as the end of the world. It's Ushuaia, the tip of Argentina. Uh, and if actually you you cross uh, Ushuaia, uh, you arrive to what really is the last inhabited place in the in the in the world uh, in the south, which is Puerto Williams in Chile. It's actually a military garrison that it's basically mainly military personnel in a, in a very kind of godforsaken place with absolutely nothing there. Um, but what it is, what there is there, however, <clears throat> in, the little, in the last house of the last road of that little island at the end of the world is the house of Cristina Calderón, who is the last speaker of Yagan. You know, this was another incredible coincidence. Um, and uh, the, 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 the Yagan Indians populated the, the Tierra del Fuego uh, region. And, uh, and it so happened that I was able to finally locate her after weeks and weeks of trying, months in fact. And, um, and when I, after my interview with her, I knew that my project was finally over, <laughs> you know, and that it was time to go home, you know. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, the project, uh, uh, which, you know, took, took the for many forms of many, uh, uh, many manifestations, you know, it took me a while to, to get back to become myself, and it took me three months. Uh, of, during which I was making collages to describe my experience. It was really the only thing I could possibly do um, to, to kind of uh, extricate myself again from those memories. Um, it really was a project uh, about, th that really attempted to question ideas of, some, some of the things that I talked about at the beginning of this, uh, in my performance, you know, about the, our relation with idealism, you know, and as artists, as artists that are socially engaged, and how, and, you know, the, or the legacy of modernism uh, has made us, as contemporary artists, very, very, <clears throat> very sarcastic and very cynical about the world. You know, and we feel that the only, the only kind of statement that we can do can be only a question. It can be only a sarcastic comment or, or something, something uh, confrontational. You know, <clears throat> when in reality many people around, around the, around the ages, you know, have chosen that the, the most avant-garde thing to do is actually to be a populist. You know, and to and to actually engage with the public by, by making aesthetic decisions that are the, that 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 embrace the, the larger audiences instead. So I mean, those are those are some things that I think about that I'm thinking about right now, and and also finally the what is really the, the personal, the public versus the personal. You know, and I'll just conclude with just one little video, speaking of the personal. You know, since. <clears throat> you know, I became a father, and they said, I am, I'm a father. this is the proof that I am. Uh, <clears throat> um, uh, I was invited to, um, to do a performance at the Center for Curatorial Studies in Bard, uh, which is a very non-baby friendly place. You know? <laughs> um, and I thought, you know, why not bring my, my daughter, you know, and perform with her, you know? Uh, and also being a, being a new father, but created all sorts of anxieties for me, you know, I felt that my life as an artist was over. You know, I would just be a babysitter for the rest of my life. You know? uh, <coughs> um, and, um, and then I thought I would do a, a story. Uh, uh, I, I decided to do a project with this, my, my daughter's called Estela, um, uh, based on a, what is really my favorite short American short story of all time by Nathaniel Hawthorne, 
uh, I think is really the best uh, piece of writing ever written <laughs> in the U.S. literature. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a story uh, called Wakefield. It's a very short story, very surreal. It's almost like Jorge Luis Borges could have written it. Uh, but, but the thing is that he, Nathaniel Hawthorne wrote it in 1830. You know? uh, it's about, it's a, and it's, a very, it's almost like a Kafkaesque story. Um, it's simply, it's a, a very simple story. It's, it's about a man who's married, he, he, well, he's, uh, he and his wife live together in this little house. Uh, his name is Wakefield. And one day, he, for no apparent reason, uh, steps out, supposedly to run an errand, and he decides to never return to his house. He just crosses the street, rents another apartment, and sits there and watches to see events unfold. So people look for him like crazy at first. Um, uh, they look and look and look, and you know, days and weeks and months go by, and then finally they decide that he's gone, that he's dead. So his wife starts wearing uh, dark clothes, and, he sees like the darkness of all that, you know, he's, the, he's, he's being mourned, he watches all that, uh, and his wife, now a, a widow, supposedly, uh, continues living in that house, and he continues over the years watching her, you know. And after 20 some or 30 something years, uh, when both are old, you know, and she's still in that house, also for no apparent reason, he decides to step out of that apartment, cross the street, and knock on the door. And uh, it's, it's a, such a beautiful story, but I, that it really is, to me, it's really about a story about our, um, our need to say no, to change the, the course of events, you know, and the, break, the, 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 the need to really, and, and our fear to really being able to do that, and how life, in a way, really controls our destiny so much, I mean, more, in ways that, we, that we're more capable to do. So those are the questions that I'm interested, uh, both in, in political terms and personal terms. And I'll just finish with this. It in a small apartment near the fireside, an apartment that was previously bespoken. <clears throat> he is in the street next door to his own house, and he is at his journey's end. He cannot believe his good fortune, thinking that maybe he was hitherto unperceived indeed, but remembering that at some point he was delayed by the crowds, that he found himself under bright spotlight, that uh, somebody perhaps was following him, that there were footsteps behind his own, and somebody had muttered his name, that he fancied it was his own, that um, perhaps a dozen bus would have followed him and then gone back to his wife to tell him about the whole affair. <coughs> Poor Wakefield. Little knowest thou of thine own insignificance in this world. No human eye but mine has followed you be. Go quietly to sleep, you foolish man. And on the morrow, if you might be wise, you should go back to thy wife and tell her the truth. Depart ye not from yet a little weak from her chaste bosom, where she for a moment to deem you dead or lost or lastingly divided, thou wouldst be woefully conscious of a change in the true wife forever after. It is perilous to make a chasm in human affections, not that they gape so long and wide, but that they so quickly close again. Thank you. <clears throat>